In this lecture, we're going to focus on a number of different decision-making models, discussing the processes involved with them, as well as their uses, advantages, and disadvantages. First, we begin with teams where interactions are on relatively equal footing, and there are three big ways that decisions tend to be made in these types of situations. First is decision by consensus, where all members have a part in shaping the decision and all people in the group find it an acceptable means of accomplishing a mutual goal. There is the assumption that reaching an agreement amongst the group is desirable and opposition to a position shouldn't be the basis for exclusion from the group. So people work through their disagreements in order to achieve mutually agreed on decisions. This demonstrates a true commitment to group goals. There are some advantages naturally to this. First is an increased commitment to implementing the decision and also a, a greater level of commitment to the group itself. Second, there is a potential to improve the quality of the decision. And third, it is quite a vigilant decision-making strategy. That is, it takes some time. That also suggests that there are several conditions for choosing it. The first is that a group is comprised of members who are equals and who are relatively open in expressing their ideas about and interests in the group decision. Why? Because second, the members themselves have a strong commitment to reaching agreement as a group. Third, they approach the decision-making process with open minds rather than being committed ahead of time to a particular position. Fourth, they're focused on the group's goals, not their own independent or individual goals. And fifth, there is time available for extended discussion. The second type of, of peer group decision making are decisions by majority vote. Put very simply, 50% plus one of the members support the decision. Or, you know, in some cases, in some groups, majorities can be specially selected, Robert's Rules of Orders, those kinds of things. But a majority has spoken in this case. It's efficient, it certainly prevents impasses, and a lot of times it's quite necessary when organizations or groups can't rely on unanimity. However, they can, of course, be harmful to the interests of the minority because those can be overlooked. We've heard the concept of the tyranny of the majority because there are winners and losers. So communication during the process often increases the potential to be a winner because you're advocating more successfully per, for a particular position and soliciting allies. Unfortunately, it also has the potential to decrease commitment to both the decision and the group, but it is appropriate in a number of cases. First, when closure on an issue is more important than harmony in the group. Second, when time is of the essence. Third, when members enter the decision-making process already having a high commitment to a particular position. Fourth, when the goals of the group members are inconsistent and sometimes even incompatible. And fifth, when the long-term support of the full group is not actually necessary for the implementation of the decision. Then the third type of decision-making in peer groups are decisions by negotiation. This is when decisions are made by reaching compromises in the positions that members had at the beginning of the decision-making process. It is a recognition of the interdependence of group members as well as the competing goals. So the idea is that the decision is some midpoint between the positions. Then decisions are recognized as expressing the interests of individual members, but they can often be a lot more piecemeal. So this suggests that members of the group are likely to disagree with certain aspects of the decision, but find enough value in that decision to support it generally. So support for the decision can be moderate and often only lasts long enough for the group members uh, to perceive themselves as interdependent. So again, there are several conditions for this being the useful and successful. First, is that members tend to be committed to divergent positions when the process begins. Second, they are moderately committed to the group itself. Third, there is a moderate amount of time for the decision-making process. 
Fourth, different members of the group in this case can have different amounts of power. And fifth, where the group's interdependence is sufficient to allow the support for implementation. So these are the types of decisions that tend to get made or the processes in peer groups. However, there are different kinds of group settings and different ways that, that groups work together. So we'll also take a look at a number of different decision-making formats now, depending on a range of different kinds of group situations. The first of these focus on independent work. So the nominal group technique is one where group members operate relatively independently most of the time and interact only for brief periods. Where this is useful in small groups are in four different kinds of cases. First is where the group is experiencing conflict and the members feel they can't talk openly about ideas. Second, it's NGT is useful when pressures to conform are high, and so the expression of novel ideas is discouraged, either implicitly or explicitly. Third, where it's difficult for all the members to get involved because there might be one or two dominant members. And fourth, where closure is needed, but high commitment isn't necessarily needed from each member. There are a number of advantages to the NGT. First, it helps people stay focused on the task rather than focusing on the group dynamics. Second, it prepares people for divergent viewpoints because members will expect that more than one idea will be considered. Third, in cases where there is high conflict, where, say, consensus can't be achieved, the use of voting can actually help closure with NGT. Fourth, more ideas can be produced because the brainstorming process is uninterrupted by group decision. Fifth, NGT can help negotiate groups with quite different or heterogeneous members. And sixth, it equalizes participation among all group members because ideas are allowed to be clarified. It does, however, have a few limitations. First, it requires relatively large amount of time or it's not effective. Second, over time, the NGT becomes less satisfying for people. Third, there are no opportunities to really work out differences of opinion in this. And fourth, decisions that are made may actually represent a false consensus. So if you take a look at the process, you get a sense that this is really about a group of people all working on the project or a problem at the same time, but not really working together. We also take a look at a different style of decision making through visualization, or in this case, a mind mapping style. This process is concerned with finding ways to mix logic, language, and judgments with images, emotions, rhythms, and creativity to enhance the decision-making process. It helps members to see relationships amongst ideas, so it can be useful in a couple of different contexts. First, amongst groups who are wanting to develop and use creative ideas, and second, it can also be used to help organize decision-making efforts in the creative process. So within those contexts, it can have several kinds of advantages. The first is that it's a tool for increasing creativity, but what it does is it systematically records the ideas so they're not lost. Second, it encourages members to think of their ideas as much more related, to allow people to see opportunities via rapid recording with organizing later. Third, it allows group members to see key issues throughout the discussion connecting big picture and little picture, the micro and the macro. Fourth, it provides a content focus. And finally, it really does increase all given group members' expertise on a given issue, but it certainly has some limitations. First, not all people are comfortable with such a visual process. And second, Creating a group map can actually be quite difficult. So how do you do mind mapping? There are seven steps to making a mind map. So first, start in the center of a blank page and turn it sideways. Why? 
Because starting in the center actually gives your brain the freedom to spread out in all directions. Um, it lets people express themselves more freely or naturally. Second, use an image or a picture for your central idea. Why? Because the image itself helps to focus the imagination. A central image is more interesting, keeping your mind and the group's mind focused, improves concentration, and kind of gives people a bit more of energy about it. Third, use colors throughout. Because colors are actually exciting to our brains, as are the images. So they give an extra bit of vibrancy to the mind map, and it, and it pushes the creativity in the process. Fourth, connect the main branches to the central image and connect your second and third level branches to the first and second levels, etc. Why? Because the brain works by association. If you take it looks if you, if you take a look at how things link together, it becomes easier to draw connections. It also becomes easier to branch off and into different kinds of directions than you would have thought about in the first place. Fifth, make the branches curved rather than straight lines. Why? Again, this is about tricking the brain a little bit. Straight lines tend to shut the brain down. Curved lines tend to tend to keep the mind thinking creativity, creatively. Sixth, use one keyword per line, per line, because this gives the single word gives your mind map more power and more flexibility. The more you start to describe, the more that we get confined into small boxes. And seventh, use images throughout. Because each image, like the central image, is also something that can bring to mind other ideas and connections. So think about it this way, that when you, when you put a mind map together, it is really about the creative process. This is certainly useful in issues and crisis management when you're trying to think of solutions and you have a bit of luxury of the time, so it's useful during the planning process itself. The next kind of visualization decision-making format is involves decision trees. Decision trees help people to visualize alternative courses of action as well as their consequences. Again, this is quite useful for issues in crisis management because there, there are really three conditions where these are effective. First, when groups are considering mutual exclusive, mutually exclusive alternatives, that can have multiple consequences. Second, they can be used to lay out options and the consequences. And third, they're useful when a series of decisions has to be made, where sequences and outcomes for decisions are actually quite important. This means, though, that there are some key advantages. First, Decision trees allow groups to visualize possible choices and outcomes when there are a lot of what-ifs to account for. Second, systematically laying out options makes it easier to consider the complicated issues involved in the task. Third, adding in visual elements helps groups to focus on the task. And fourth, it allows members to get deeper into the decision-making process than off the, off the top of the head kinds of judgments. However, there are a lot of limitations to decision trees. First, using it can actually complicate the process for making decisions. Second, it may be actually more involved than groups are interested or have time for. Third, the tree itself doesn't make the decision, it only presents the options available. Fourth, it's really only useful when all reasonable options have been identified, analyzed, and evaluated. It is not a creative process. Fifth, it doesn't generate additional information, it only uses known information. Sixth, not all outcomes are comparable. Sometimes you end up trying to compare apples and oranges and it just doesn't work. And seventh, representing all possible outcomes may actually distort the group's perceptions of all of these outcomes being equal when in fact they're quite not. But then if we move away from independent 
action and visualization, we also get into examples of decision-making formats that focus on critical thinking. And there are two principal approaches in this, devil's advocacy and dialectical inquiry. These use methods traditionally associated with debate as decision-making. Both include evaluating premises, evidence, and reasoning as arguments that are weighed in considering the options. It's, it's very possible in these cases to use competing subgroups as a tool for avoiding groupthink and also getting the deepest critique of each other's ideas. So the devil's advocacy and dialectical inquiry is as two decision-making formats focus on cr focusing on critical thinking have some particular context in which they're useful. First, when alternatives for the decision are reasonably equal in terms of costs and benefits. And second, especially relevant is where the decision in question is really important so that all foreseeable dire consequences have been really thoroughly interrogated. This means that there are three critical advantages to these approaches. First, is that debate in decision making is good because it involves systematic inquiry into the position, the grounds, and the support for the decision. Second, argumentative clash tests the premises, premises, evidence, and the reasoning to find the best information and alternatives possible. Third, this means that this, the decision taken is most likely to be both reasonable and defensible. More than that, it also can help to avoid groupthink. But there are certainly some limitations. First, advocates are decision makers, so it can actually be quite difficult to objectively evaluate different kinds of ideas. Second, it actually does rely on the members being quite reasonable, not just getting into their camps and being quite dogmatic about it. Third, the process can be harmed by those who are overly intent on reaching a decision. Fourth, this is not useful if quick action is needed because it makes it hard to really fully satisfy the needs in both of these methods. And fifth, as we probably all know, debate can affect social relationships when people don't deal with controversy particularly well. So these can be really important approaches, but it also involves a certain level of confidence, skill, and comfort with one another. However, there are also decision-making formats for problems and solutions. The Performance Evaluation and Review Technique, or PERT, is one of these. It's a project management approach used to schedule, organize, and coordinate tasks within a project. It's basically a method to analyze the tasks involved in completing a given project, especially the time needed to complete the task, and then identify the minimum amount of time needed to complete the entire project. So it answers questions of how long it'll take to develop the necessary parts of the solution, how do the responsibilities of an implementation relate and how do they how do groups actually implement the solutions in the times allotted the thing about the PERT technique is that groups have to have decided on their solutions before this technique is useful it's not about figuring out the best solution it's about figuring out how to implement it so that means there are three cases where it's useful first when groups are making decisions about implementation Second, because it allows groups to focus on considering steps, their sequence, and the time needed. And third, it is most useful in novel situations to the group, not routine ones. So when people don't really know what to expect or what's going to come. But where it's implemented, it can have four advantages. First, it focuses the group's attention on the steps involved in implementation, time needed, and distribution of human capital and other resources. Second, it focuses both on long- and short-term goals to help in the time management. Third, it reduces the tendency to procrastinate amongst the groups. Fourth, it also helps group members see how their tasks relate to the tasks of other members but it also has a few kinds of limitations. 
First, it can't help groups arrive at the decisions and or the solutions themselves. Second, without sufficient information about the time and resources needed, decisions made here may not be useful. And third, rushing through this process is likely to result in poor levels of implementation. Now, all of these decision-making formats are all fine and dandy, but we're talking about high-stress situations in a lot of cases when we're talking about issues in crisis management. So it's also useful to think about teamwork in high-stress situations. So all of these models can be useful, but what happens in these cases? A lot of the time, instead of relying on the structures that have been rehearsed and tried for groups, situations can devolve a little bit. Um, for example, I've been in a team circumstance where we were under a tight deadline and our computer system completely crashed. Of course, everyone's stress level skyrocketed. However, I also had the chance to witness one of the most unreal adult reactions. A colleague quite literally laid on the table, kicked his legs, flailed his arms in the air, and had a proper temper tantrum. The rest of us were what you could say, um surprised. I will say that it broke the tension and the rest of us got to work, but it also meant that the tantrum maker, yeah, he was looked at a little bit differently from there out. But in a more technical sense, what happens? Well, these four things tend to happen when they're high stress moments. And let's face it, Crises are about as high stress in most organizations as we can get. So it tends to limit discussion. Decisions tend to get more rushed. And in, in particular, groupthink is a much higher likelihood. Communication becomes more challenging. People's tempers get a little short. People are more likely to snap at each other. And power differences, both formal and informal, tend to be amplified. And this brings us to the Challenger case from the mid-1980s. No doubt most people are familiar with the situation that the skyrocket or that the rocket exploded because of a failed and painfully inexpensive O-ring. The real story is what happened behind the scenes. President Reagan had placed pressure on NASA because it looked like the Soviets were making adv advances in the space race, and he was committed to winning the Cold War. So the Challenger launch had to take place. The problem with the O-rings was a known problem, that when the outside temperature dropped below 50 degrees Fahrenheit and then were subjected to the conditions during launch, they were likely to fail. This problem had been communicated by the engineers, but because of the stress, their concerns were dismissed and they were told that the risks were acceptable because the probability is low. Because of the stressful organizational environment, what happened is that groupthink took place. No one really ended up disagreeing. They all kind of went along with it. So this was also a very small group of specialists in a tight hierarchical power structure. So the astronauts functionally lost their lives because of groupthink and the social and structural disempowerment of those who are in the best positions to judge the quality of the response. From a crisis perspective, it's not only important to learn the lesson from this case for good teamwork, but also in terms of the importance of getting the right people into positions of influence. So, in the case of the challenger, how can we avoid or minimize the risk of groupthink, particularly in crisis situations? Well, of course, experience, rehearsal, and organizational structures can help. But this is really only part of the story. What you need is, is a stronger kind of group culture. Now, none of this is very quickly answered, but in reviewing the, our two lectures on groupthink as well as on team roles and team structures, thinking about decision-making formats and having groups understand what their roles are, understand what the type of group is, where in the, dis the, the group formation process they are, and also recognizing the effects of stress un under pressure. 
these are actually quite important conversations that have to take place. And if you're interested in reading more about this kind of decision, especially decision making and decision making in high stress environments, these are some good sources to start with.